Good. All right. So um, we're going to get uh, started on engineering drawings today. That's what we're going to be learning about. So cool. Um, first thing you want to do, um, SolidWorks opens up like this again, right? Um, if the tab here isn't open, um, just go to File, New. And then this time, instead of part or assembly, we're going to be clicking on drawing. So this kind of opens up. Don't click anything yet. I'm just going to talk about drawings a little bit. Um, so the point of drawings is for us to be able to communicate with other people um, in a very quick and simple manner of, OK, um, so I designed this part or assembly, and I want to tell the world what I made and communicate it in a way other people can understand, right? Um, it's hard for us to send and even print things that are in the three dimension, right? It's kind of hard to grab that unless holographs become a thing one day. Um, so we project things all in like a two dimensional kind of feature and then print it out on a piece of paper and say, hey, this is the 3D object I made. These are the various views it comes if you project it in a 2D way. Um, yeah, make this for me. Someone go, right? Um, so that's kind of the purpose of drawings, is to be able to communicate all this information to someone. Um, cool. So the first thing we kind of see here is sheet format. So super simple. Um, if you don't see all of these options here, you probably have this little checkbox checked on. Uh, if that's the case, check it off. You'll see more options open up soon. Um, so yeah, so the sheet format, uh, pretty much it's asking you um, Okay, so how do you want to, what kind of si uh, size of paper do you want to display your drawings on, right? Um, the way you go about selecting that is kind of two things. One, what kind of paper do you have available for you? I mean, sure, we could print, uh, we could make this drawing on something 16.53 inches by 11.69, but I mean, it, that's only if you have a paper that size, right? Um, so yeah, um, it's based on that, selecting on what kind of uh, paper you have available to you, and also for the fact of um, how do I want to represent my drawing, right? If your part is something that's very long and thin, um, you don't, you probably don't want to be using something like a very wide, short, like landscape um, kind of orientation in order to represent that drawing. You want to have enough space, right? You would choose something a lot longer, um, kind of thinner, something like that, right? Um, that's something that you might want to use if you have a really tall and long part. Um, so it depends on the part um, you have and also how you want to represent them. Um, in this case, um, typically we resort to A, um, so the A landscape or A portrait. Um, so as you can see, it's a typical 8.5 by 11 um, sheet size. Um, so it's a regular printer paper, so it's very compatible with your printers. And also when your printers um, end up printing it, um, and you print to, um, and you place your models in a one-to-one -one ratio, if it fits, um, it will actually be the exact size of what you want it to be. If you were to lay your part on top <coughs> of the drawing, um, it would fit perfectly. Um, cool. For, uh, so for today, we're going to click on A portrait. Um, so we're going to be projecting our model on this. So just double click it. And by default, it kind of loads this sheet, right? So this is an 8.5 by sheet, 8.5 uh, by 11 sheet. Um, and yeah. So the next thing that opens up is your model view right here if you look in your property manager, right? By default, it uh, selects this option in the view layout. If you look on the top view layout bar toolbar, um, you see that the model view button is depressed. Um, by default, it chooses that for you. So it's pretty much asking you at this point, okay, which part or assembly do you want to put in your drawing to represent? Um, keep that in mind. You could, um, you could do drawings for parts or assemblies. Um, if you have a complex assembly, you can place them all here, and then it'll. Uh, you can do um, add some features to that. So from here, we're gonna go to browse on the properties manager manager tab, and then go look for that robot head file that we used before. So robot head, as you can see, just double click it. Cool, so don't click anything else uh, yet. Don't place it on there. Um, make sure it's kind of floating around. If you did, just control Z it and then go back to the stage. Um, I want to talk about a few things. Um, so yeah, um, kind of there's a few things, um, parameters if you look to the left of your properties manager. Um, the first thing you see is reference configuration. 
So when we were working on parts, I mentioned before that you could have multiple configurations to your part, right? So in a single part folder, you could have multiple designs for that part. If we were to have multiple configurations um, on that part, they would load in this drop-down menu. If you were to click that, all your configurations would load up. In this case, we only have a single default configuration because we didn't design anything else for the robot head. Um, so we're left with that one option. Um, but that's something nifty to keep in mind. If you have multiple configurations, you can load them up as you please. Cool. So the next thing that we see on the Properties Manager tab is orientation. So orientation, um, I'm going to talk about a few like basic um, design um, kind of like principles. As you guys take uh, MA94, you guys will learn a lot more about it. Um, so a projection is essentially you trying to make a 3D object into a two-dimensional object, right? Um, this accounts for physical objects or even in just like math. Um, you can project a 3D vector, like a matrix into a 2D vector. Um, that's pretty much what, what it's doing, um, but in this case, we have a three-dimensional model, um, but since a drawing can't be three-dimensional, um, it's going to project it flat into a 2D model um, of sorts. So there's uh, several views that you could have, um, several types of projections. Um, the first one is orthographic projections. Um, so the orthographic projections are these options here, these five in the left property managers. Um, so everything but that top corner one. Um, we'll talk about that next. Um, but the reason why it's called orthographic projection is because the projection is um, orthogonal or perpendicular um, to your primary planes. Um, so these options, if you kind of hover over them, you'll see them um, pop up with like the names like front, top, bottom, and left, right, and rear. Okay, um, so that's kind of what you'll be seeing. So these reference to the origin plane that you designed your part in, right? So if I were to draw the front face features of the robot on the front <coughs> plane, when I originally made that robot head, if I were to project the front of the robot head onto here, we would see exactly that. Um, don't follow along on this part, I'm just gonna show you for example. So if I were to click here, you see that we see the front of the robot head, right? And I had the front um, view orientation selected. Cool. So yeah, um, so this is kind of your starting point wherever you play, uh, whenever you place a model. You could place a, um, however you want it to as your first model. Um, like um, pretty much the first um, view that you insert in here, it becomes called the parent view. Um, it's the original one that you put in there and then you start making different views in reference to that one. So we'll kind of go more about it, um, uh, go over more about it in, in a bit. Um, so yeah, those uh, five, uh, four, five, six, six options are your orthogonal projection views. Um, the one in the corner over there, that's called isometric. Um, so the prefix iso means same. Um, metric means measurements, right? So it's the same measurement. Um, so pretty much what it's doing, the view that you'll get is something that looks a lot like this. If I select that and place it here. So it's like an angled view, right? And if you guys notice that this robot head is a cube, and you notice that these three edges are of the same length. Um, so Isometric, what that means, since it's the same measurements, um, you're looking at, if this is like your, if this, like, uh, if this phone is your object that you're looking at, we're looking at it so we see all three axes, uh, axes X, Y, Z, um, at the same length. Um, they're the same angle apart. Um, Kevin, Kevin, do we have a marker? Yeah, I just want to draw something. So I've kind of, it's a little confusing, um, so I'll kind of talk about that um, a little bit more and then draw some figures so you guys can follow along. Um, but yeah, um, you guys can see there's diametric and trimetric as well. Um, isometric is all three axes are um, the same angles apart. Diametric is two of the axes are the same angle. The third one could be different. And trimetric is where all the angles between the axes are different. Um, so yeah, thanks. Oh. I don't need you, Kevin. <laughs> Just kidding, I love you. <laughs> Alright, um, so I'm just going to draw this out here. Uh -huh. 
So imagine this is our coordinate system, right? Um, could everyone kind of see this? Um, so we have our x-axis, our y-axis, and the z-axis. When we're doing an orthographic um, view, we're looking at a single plane, such as this, or another one, or top, side, left, right, but not. But when we're looking at an isometric view, we're kind of looking at it from this angle. And if you were to project this 3D coordinate system onto a flat piece of paper, you would end up with this kind of shape. Right? So x, y, z. So that's what it would kind of look like if you were looking at an isometric view. And the angle between these coordinates, if you were to measure them with like a protractor, um, it'd be Do your math. <laughs> so um, they will make a full circle 360 degrees, right? And if you divide it into three subsections, um, they're 120 degrees. So you're looking at it pretty much from the corner, exactly from the corner. Um, if you were doing a diametric view, you would have these two be the same, and this third angle be something <coughs> arbitrary, um, depending on what the remainder is. Um, for trimetric, they would all be different angles. So yeah, um, most commonly we use isometric and ortho uh, orthographic. Um, diametric and trimetric are very case by case, whether you need it or not. So yeah, from there, we're going to see the display styles. So if you scroll down on your properties manager, you'll see your next um, parameter called the display style right here. So there's several display styles you could have. So originally when you make your part, it comes as a solid model, right? It comes as a shaded model that looks kind of realistic. Um, the first one is called wireframe, the first button. If you were to click that, pretty much what happens is that you see every edge on that model, whether it's behind another object or in front of it, you'll end up seeing everything. Um, you kind of see that, right? That ear, the left, right ear of the robot head shouldn't be seen from this orientation, but we still see it. Um, so that's wireframe. Um, usually it's like one of those um, views you use to like wow people in terms of how much detail there is in your part. Um, but as you can see, it's not a very useful tool in terms of displaying, uh, conveying certain information, right? It's hard to interpret what's what. Um, so usually you kind of stay away from wireframe unless you have a, a specific need to or if it's just purely for display purposes. Next one is hidden lines visible, that second button. So pretty much what it does is very similar to wireframe, um, except every line that you shouldn't be seeing. So like um, the lines back here, those are called hidden lines, right? Those lines you shouldn't be seeing. Um, it displays those hidden lines as dotted lines to indicate, oh, I'm a hidden line. I shouldn't be here, but I'm just going to be showing myself here anyways. So I'm going to click on that. So as you guys can see, right, all these dotted lines, those lines shouldn't be shown um, if you were to look at this physical model, but it displays it here to say, okay, yeah, these are the details I have, um, but I'm indicating myself as a hidden line so you don't get confused. The third option, which is the option that's selected by default and the option that you will end up using the most usually is hidden lines removed. So it's exactly the same thing as this, except all the dotted lines disappear. So you only see all the edges that you would see on the model itself. So yeah, so that conveys information clearly on all the features and the um, characteristics of this part are displayed. And it does away with all the fancy like shading and the surface like texture and the color that you apply to the part from before. But the next option that we have is shaded wood edges. So shaded wood edges is pretty much this view right here. Um, except it applies your coloring and then um, as if light was contacting the part. So we're just going to preview that. So it looks like pretty much what you would design in your part, right? And, um, it's all works with it as if you were making the part. Um, the edges are accented, accented with a solid black line to tell it, like, distinguish where that edge is specifically. But the last <laughs> option is just shaded without edges, right? So pretty much what it does is it shows exactly this, but doesn't have any of the edge accents. So this is probably what you would show if you wanted to show the most realistic view of your part, right? Okay, this is what it's going to look like, the final product. Um, it's going to be have smooth contours and nothing, <coughs> no black line is actually there on that part. So yeah, this is primarily for um, kind of like display if you want to show what it looks like in the end. 
Um, but yeah. Next thing in our properties manager is scaling. So if you scroll down, you'll see scale here. Um, by default, if you do use sheet scale, um, the part will be loaded uh, based on whatever the sheet scale um, parameters are. Um, typically, I end up resorting back to use custom scale. Um, so what scaling does is that it shrinks down your um, your uh, the, or the view of your part that you projected on here. Um, by whatever factor you define it to be. If you do two to one, it will be blown up two times. If you do one to two, all the dimensions will be halved. However, it doesn't reduce the dimensioning of your parts. It only uh, reduces, only scales the representation of it. So last time, if you guys remember, we designed this to be a four by four by four cube, right? If I were to dis, uh, scale it by half, it, it wouldn't be a two by two by two cube. It would still dimension out as four by four by four, um, but we would only see it in a half scale. So. You don't have to worry about the dimensioning in that aspect, and it's kind of what it does. So if you kind of go into the use custom scale option, kind of give that a click. The scale option, um, it fills in so you can select it. You kind of mess around in there and then fill in whatever you want. Um, by default, they have some several options here for you. Um, the top one, user defined root, lets you insert the value that you want to scale it by directly. So if you were to click that, you notice that text box at the bottom opens up, and then you could type in your own scaling ratio. So yeah. The last part of this tab that I want to go over is the dimension type. So dimension types is projected and true. Could anyone take a guess at what these might mean? What's the difference between the two? That's a good guess, but not quite. That's what I thought at first, too. So, actually, so I'll kind of be talking about that. So, let's say we're going to go back to a just a edge view here. Um, so, we know this cube to be 4x4x4, four by four by four, right? If we were to do a true dimension type, if we dimension this width here, it would come out as 4 inches, right? However, if we did a projected dimension type, and we tried to dimension this line here, what it would do is that it would not return a value of four inches. It would return the value of whatever you would get if you were to place a ruler right on top of this image, right? So if this was four inches wide, if my phone is four inches wide when you look at it straight ahead, if I kind of do this, from whatever angle you're looking at, the phone seems kind of shorter, right? It would return that value to you instead of that full, uh, full four inches. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Um, projected dimension type you typically use on orthographic views, right? Because it's gonna return to you exactly what it is anyways. Um, true dimension type, you usually do it for isometric views like this, where you would be thrown off if it doesn't return to you the true value. Um, typically, you just keep it on true. It's the easiest way to deal with it. Um, so yeah. So we're gonna go back up here so if you once you have your robot file selected, um, the robot head selected, and then in orientation, we're going to set it to front view. So we want to be seeing that. Keep your display style at hidden lines removed. You can kind of click through it to play around to see what it would look like in other orientations or display styles. But make sure it's on hidden lines removed at the end. Next, we're going to go to scale. We're going to use custom scale and then user defined root. And then we're going to go for an option of one to three. So one colon three. Click enter. There we go. For dimension type, keep it on true. And once you have all these parameters filled out, you can move your robot head to somewhere around the center of the paper, of the, of the page you have. And then click the OK button.
So we have our robot head, the front of it, um, placed here, right? Um, but as we saw earlier, we could choose which view to um, have as our primary view. So you might ask yourself, okay, which one do I use as my primary view? Um, typically, you should always design your part so the front plane um, displays the most features, right? Um, so for this robot head, if you were to look at the back, it would just be a flat face. Um, it wouldn't have all these features of the eyes and the mouth holes. Um, so you would always want to display um, the base with the most amount of features, with the most amount of details to be your front, um, front feature. Um, this way people know, okay, this part is, um, has the most details to it, this will probably be the front, um, and we can work off it from there. And even people who are fabricating parts like this always work off references, um, so it's nice for them to know that this is the um, original view that they want. So yeah, um, in case you accidentally design your part so the left, right, top, bottom, or back has the most amount of features, you could always reorient it so it shows that face first as your primary view orientation. Cool. Does everyone have this place on here? All right, so immediately after you place that front head, um, some of you guys might have noticed that it, start, uh, it wants to start projecting other views, right? Um, so by default, it tells you, okay, now you can start projecting different orientations of this model and then place a 2D image of that as well. Um, yeah, um, for now, just press escape to escape this mode. Um, we'll be revisiting that in a bit, um, but we just wanna kind of go over the other functions in order so you guys can kind of get them out of the way. So, nice, we have this head here up in the front. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about is the standard three view. Um, this is a function you would use for very simple parts, something that has a very clear cut left, right, top kind of view to it. Um, so, by default, it just inserts those three views, those three orthographic views. Um, so if you were to click standard three view, we're gonna browse for the part, um, we're gonna go to robot head. We're gonna undo this all anyway, so. As you can notice, by default, it loads these three views to it, right? But sometimes that might not be exactly <coughs> what we want. We might want more views to it. We might want the bottom, the left side, or the left side to the right. Um, and we might want the back even shown, depending on what kind of features are there. Um, so personally, I don't really like relying on this part unless your part is very simple and has a lot of symmetry on all three axes that you designed it on. So we're gonna undo that. We already played with model view, right? Um, and the next part, we're gonna talk about projected view. So earlier, what your um, what SolidWorks by default wanted to do after you placed your center model, um, it started projecting other views to it, right? Um, that's exactly what projected view would do as well. So give that a click. <laughs> and since the front face of the robot is the only drawing that's already in the sheet, um, it knows that you probably want to project that in different views. So, 
depending on where you drag your mouse cursor around on, right, it'll display that side. If I drag left of the uh, robot head, it'll project the left side view. If I try to drag to the right, it'll project the right side view. Same for top and bottom. And also, the cool thing is, it'll start projecting, if you go diagonal, isometric views of it in different angles. Right? So, for projected view, um, pretty much you could load um, other orthographic or isometric views from the original model. Um, projections can be altered in disp uh, display styles and scaling, independent of the original view. So, let's say, okay, I want to do this isometric view here, but I don't want a wireframe anymore. Um, I don't want this uh, edge view. I want it to be a shaded wood edges, right? You guys notice that it changes its display style independent of how that center one is. And you could also change the scaling independent of the original model as well. If you wanted this isometric view to be larger, you go to use custom scale. You can do one to one. So, yeah, so that would be what the one-to-one -one scale of that robot head looks like on this sheet of paper, right? <coughs> kind of makes sense. Um, if your sheet is eight and a half wide, it takes up about half of the paper, which is four inches, so it's a very realistic projection of what your final part's going to be like. So, yeah, um, we're not going to do that one-to-one -one scaling, but I was just showing that as a demonstration. Um, for the time being, go back to projected view. Keep your scaling to one to three. We're not going to change the display styles for now. And just project a left view. And then by default, it lets you continue projecting other views. Do a right. Oh, let's stop. We're going to go to project views again. Do a top view, a bottom view, and then drag it out diagonally to the top left again. So you get this isometric view. So once you place that isometric view, we're going to make this into a shaded wood edges display style. So you can kind of, you see that there's a orange dotted border around this one if you select it. As soon as you select that border, you see the properties manager pops up again. In the display style, we're going to click shaded wood edges. Right. Does anyone need help getting to this point? All right. So whenever you have things selected that you don't want, just just hand the sleeve several times, and then there you go. Right. So. So the reason why this shows you the orange. Um, it's because this is reference. So it shows, okay, this is selected right now, but this is the parent configuration file. So I'm just selecting that to show you that's what it's referencing. But try changing the display stuff. Yeah, you see that this shape is what it's Anyone else need help getting to this part yet? Nope. All right, so something I want to point out is once you have your uh, various isometric and orthographic views, um, you'll notice something pretty interesting. So 
you could drag these um, objects around. Yeah, so you drag these objects around. So we're gonna start with the isometric projection first. So just make sure it's selected with the blue dotted line around it. Hover over it until you see that little move cursor. You can click on it and then drag it around. So you can kind of place it anywhere, right? It's free floating right now. So ideally, we just want to place it right here. It's right there in that top right corner. And then we're going to try the same thing with this top view here. So grab it and try to move it around. You'll realize that it's restricted in only the vertical axis, right? Let's give that a try with the left view as well. The left view is bound by the horizontal axis right here. So we can tell that the isometric view is free floating. However, the um, orthogonal projections are bounded by their projection lines, quote unquote. Um, so those projection lines are pretty much originating off your um, original um, view orientation here in the center, right? We projected this left in the horizontal direction. We projected this right in the horizontal direction. Vertical, vertical. So you can kind of imagine there to be a imaginary line there where these parts are bounded by. Um, the reason behind this is that it makes it easy for certain people to reference, right? They could tell that even from the top view that the robot is robot head is as exactly wide as it should be. If you drag it over the original file, you see that it lines up perfectly, right? So yeah, it's just for ease of reading. Um, let's say you really wanted to orient these in a specific way where you wanted to have it um, just kind of free floating. If you wanted to do that, just exit anything on your property managers tab, select a drawing, any projection you want. You could right click it, and then this entire toolbar comes up. We're gonna hover over alignment. So go to alignment, and then you see break alignment. We're going to click on that. So as soon as you click on that, give that another try. Try moving that view around. So you see now it's free floating. It's not bound by the <coughs> direction line anymore. Um, you can do that to every single view you want, depending on how you want to orient your paper, uh, your your drawing. Um, but keep in mind, it is good practice to keep those bound by their projection lines usually, because um, it is easier to read. Um, and it's easier to tell that this view here on the left is in fact the left side of this robot head and not some other view. Cool. So I'm just gonna undo breaking that alignment for now. And uh, yeah, that's kind of everything for the projected view. Next thing, uh, I'm just gonna gl uh, glean over this real quick. Auxiliary view is much like projected view. However, instead of projecting off in the standard isometric or the orthographic projections, um, you could project your new drawing off from the original um, based on any geometry, um, any line or edge available on your drawing. So if you were to click auxiliary view, let's say I want to project this part about that sloped edge there, right? Let's give that a try, that should be interesting. So you see that this part does not quite look like how the right side view looked, right? So what it's doing is that it's projecting off this line here at a slight angle. So you could do that with any edge on your original model. If you did auxiliary view and then you selected any edge, you could project it off that edge. Uh, much like the isometric and the orthographic views, you could define its, uh, its, its settings uh, custom, so you can have custom scaling and custom display styles as well. So we're gonna get rid of that, we're not gonna place that on there. So yeah, auxiliary view isn't really used too often. Um, you only use it if you have a very specific need to project off that specific feature. Um, yeah, so it, you only use it if you, need to, uh, if you find a use for it. Next part, we're gonna talk about section view. So section view is a super cool tool. Um, this part isn't really the best for this demonstration, but I'll kind of go over it anyways. Um, Anyone take a wild guess at what section view does? Chris. Chops it, uh, it gives you, it gives you a, a view of what it Yeah, um, 
That's exactly what it does. Um, wherever you define your section line, your section cut line, um, it will kind of give you a view of that part um, cut from that line. So we're going to kind of apply that to the front base. So click on section view, hover over the front, uh, front face projection, and then you can see you can kind of drag it along anywhere, right? So with your mouse kind of hovering over this top edge line right there, so we could bound it exactly to the center, take it so it snaps right at the center of the robot face there, and then click. So as soon as you click it, all these parameters are kind of grayed out on the left um, properties manager, so don't worry about it. Um, just click the green checkbox, OK, or you can press Enter as well. So once you do that, much like how the left and right orthographic projections were, you can project a cross-section view of your robot based on that. But however, you'll see that no matter which direction I go, even if I go left or right, the view is exactly the same. So in, if you wanted the other direction, in your properties manager, you could do auto uh, flip direction here, this button, and it would view uh, it will give you a view of the other direction from where you set your cutting line from. So just kind of you can play around with that. Let's see what that would look like. So you can see that it's showing the different uh, other direction now. The way you could tell that it's um, showing which view is by seeing these arrows right here on your cutting section line. So the, that dashed line is your section line and these arrows indicate which direction you're looking at it from, right? So we're looking from left to right right now, and that's a cross-section of the robot that we see. So I'm gonna cancel that to a different section view. This one should be a little bit more interesting. We're going to hover over this eye and then snap it right to the center of that right eye. Click OK. And then we want to be looking left this time. So from right to left. If that arrow isn't in the right direction, just click flip direction. And then we're going to place it somewhere here over to the right. And then we're going to click OK. So yeah, um, there's a bunch of different parameters here. Um, Pretty much what you could do for section views, you could do quarter sections, half sections. Um, this would be considered like a half section, um, but you could do a quarter section view, a uh, bunch of other options. Um, kind of play around with this when you have the chance. Um, you guys will be working on engineering drawings for your project as well. Um, so you, if you have any cool internal features, um, you can kind of show that off by doing the sectional view. So yeah, click OK for now once you get that view. As you can see again, it's bound by that projection line, so we're going to break that alignment. Right click on that projection, go to alignment, break alignment, and we're going to drag this baby right to the bottom, right here. So when you make this sectional view, you could see uh, certain notations pop up, right? So underneath that sectional view, you see section CC, scale 1, 3, right? So, okay, um, what if you had a bunch of other sectional views in your drawing? How do you know which one's which? You could tell by seeing that there's a line right here, right? Um, and it has a label C and C. So it's showing a section view of the line from these points right there. If I were to do another section view, um, but if you go to your left and see your properties manager, right? There's a vertical cutting line and a horizontal cutting line. Um, the first one we did was vertical, um, so we're going to try a horizontal this time. Click on horizontal, <coughs> float over the robot head again, and we're going to place it right there, snap to that left eye center. Click OK. see a bottom to top sectional view, right? 
So that's what the inside of this robot looks like from that point. Um, yeah, so as you can notice, in order to uh, distinguish itself, it so, uh, shows you that this is section DD, and it labels as section DD here, and section CC is the one here. So yeah, in case you ha end up having a lot of sectional views, um, it labels it automatically, so it's easy to tell. So we're going to get rid of that horizontal section view for now. Cool. Next function is the detail view. So pretty much what the detail view does, it does a close-up zoom of whatever portion of the model you want to view. Um, so let's say we have a great interest in where this little antenna joint is going to be right there between the ball of the antenna and the shaft. Let's say we really want to know what it looks like close up, and it's hard to tell from this point, right? So click on detail view up on the top ribbon right there. You can zoom in to where, whichever point. So you can click anywhere on the drawing, or you can click at a bounding edge, like right there. So for the time being, we're just going to hover over that little corner edge right there, make sure it's highlighted, so, and then click. And then you see the, a circle is being drawn, a circle of whatever radius that, that defines it to be. So this isn't quite a sketch, but you'll see what it does. Um, limit yourself to somewhere around like 0.68 inches of the radius of the circle. And click. And immediately, you end up with a view, close up, a close up view of everything in that circle right there. So this drawing, this new drawing you have floating with your mouse cursor, is a zoom in of that. So yeah, much like your um, every other thing that we've done so far, you could set its custom display style, or you could do custom scaling to it. If it was a really complex small feature there, you would really like zoom in that scaling feature, right? So you have a very like, really big close up of that. Um, for the time being, we're going to leave it as is, as 2, 3. If it's not on that, you guys could go change it. And then we're just going to place it up here in the left, top left corner. So yeah, much <laughs> like how the sectional view was kind of notated, um, we see that this notation is automated, uh, automatically made for us, right? So it shows us, okay, detail view E. We can find that here, the circle and an E next to it. And it's at a scale of two to three. Um, as we change that, these notations will automatically update themselves to be whatever you want it to be. All right. Anyone need help with this part? Everyone good? Okay. So let's say these are all the views that we want on this sheet. OK, um, this is everything, all the information that we need, um, at least in terms of views. Um, OK, now how do we communicate what these sizes actually are to whoever's manufacturing this component, right? So we're going to be playing around with the annotation tabs in the toolbar. So from View Layout, click on Annotation. And we see all these options open up. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them. Um, some of them are kind of redundant and very specific in terms of what functions they do. Um, but we're going to be talking about the key, uh, key ones um, that you'll be using the most often. So something very familiar that you've seen before is Smart Dimension. So Smart Dimension here works just like any other dimensioning tool that we've used so far, um, whether it's in parts or assemblies. Um, except instead of defining a part size, uh, um, the size of a feature, it just reads it out instead. So if we go to Smart Dimension, click on that. We're going to be <laughs> referencing on the left side face of this robot. Click on the top edge of that cube. Click on the bottom edge of that cube. And then you see this number, this dimension projects outwards, right? And then wherever you click it, it just places that number. And 
this time you can tell that it doesn't ask you to enter in a number in there, right? It just kind of reads out the value. And no matter how you scale it, how you scale this image, it'll always read out four inches unless you have a projected uh, measurement type on and it's off angle. Um, that's when it'll be thrown off a little bit. But yeah, so from here, you say, okay, now I have to start dimensioning everything, right? This person needs to know how to do, like, we're gonna start, oh, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and everything. Um, but as you can kind of already guess from here, just adding a lot of dimensions is not the best way to communicate the information. It kind of gets messy, it gets really hectic soon, right? Um, there's a proper way of, there's a proper practice of dimensioning things, and I'll be kind of going over that right now. So, we're gonna undo this. Um, so yeah, so there's something called your datum feature, um, D-A-T-U-M, datum, um, and feature. Um, so, does anyone know what a datum is so far? No? So, what a datum means is that it's your reference, or like zero positioning, right? So, we could arbitrarily start dimensioning random features, um, but one could only infer so much information from it unless they start doing some math on their own, right? Uh, like for say, if we were to only dimension these edges, the space between the fillets, that's 3.5 inches, right? But relative in what location is that 3.5 inches wide? Um, are those two fillets on the side the same size? Are they different? Um, you could only make so many inferences before you say, I have no idea what this part is going to be like, right? So you always select a datum reference on both your x and y axis, so on two axes, right? Let's see, so for this side, let's say we're gonna define this bottom to be our datum, this actually this bottom side uh, of the neck right here, and then we're gonna refer to this left, um, the back side of the head, I guess, the left side line as our x axis datum. So pretty much what we'll be doing is that we'll be dimensioning everything off from those two lines. Um, it'll give us a good reference point and know that these are how the measurements propagate. So as an example, just kind of follow along from now. Um, just kind of start dimensioning things and then you'll kind of understand what I mean. So we're gonna click on Smart Dimension. We're gonna do all the X measurements first. So click on that. Click on the front of the eye right there. So we always start with the biggest measurement we need. There we go. Click on the back again. Click on this front face. And drag it down so the dimensions don't overlap. Click on the back face again. And then you can click on that inner line. Just like that one right there. Drag it down. And then we're gonna drag, dimension this little portion right here. So you guys can kind of get where I'm going with this, right? All the dimensions that we made so far start at this single point. So the reason, the reason for us doing this is that it makes it easier for us to read the dimensions um, relative to what they are and condenses it all into one little information. Um, Obviously, we would still dimension key, um, key important features, such as the diameter of this neck by itself. Like something like that, you would dimension. Yeah. Because it's important to know that that part is exactly three inches. Um, so yeah, it's a matter of judgment call when you're dimensioning these things. Um, you wanna make sure that it's concise and easy to read, but also at the same time that you're uh, making sure you dimension key important features by themselves as well, um, just so you know where they are. So yeah, um, you could do this for pretty much every single view, uh, but at the same time, you could, you could imagine how cluttered this entire sheet would get if you were to dimension just like this for every single part, right? But at the same time, you notice that if certain dimensions will be redundant, right? If I were to measure this width right here, it would be the same width as that part. Um, so that's a judgment call you would make and say, okay, that is a redundant dimension. I don't have to dimension it. Someone who knows how to interpret this drawing should be able to infer that 
this and this part is symmetrical right now and it will have the same value. So you would not dimension any of the features here because it's exactly the same as this. Um, in a case like this, where you actually have symmetry, you would only actually insert one side of the view. Um, typically, the right side is uh, preferable, uh, just as a good practice. Uh, but we put in the left here, and we dimension the left side. Um, but theoretically, we don't even need this view here at all. Uh, I just kind of place it there for us to kind of understand. But as we can tell, the top and the bottom are different. Um, that's why we made both views present. So yeah, um, we're going to dimension the bottom view just for fun and practice. So click on the from ear to ear. So we can tell that's 4.75 inches. We're going to use our left side as our datum. We're going to measure that. 4.65. Measure from that outer ear to here. so on, we could do that. Um, but we also want to make sure we dimension key features such as the diameter of this neck and its inner diameter. <coughs> and also we could dimension things like just how wide this eye is. If we wanted to dimension that depth of the eye, we could directly dimension that depth right there, that edge. But we could also start dimensioning from the bottom to the top there. And then do another dimension right to the front surface of the robot face. And with super simple math, someone could infer that, OK, the depth of that extrusion is a quarter inch long, right? So it's a matter of present, presenting just the right amount of information. Cool. All right. So the next function that we're going to talk about is this one right here. Note. So note, super simple, very straightforward. Um, it's just like a text box. Um, you go in here to your text box, make it any size you want, and we can type in anything like that's something we wanted as a notation inside our drawing, that's what we would do. And you can place, automatically it kind of wants to project an arrow on it. So wherever we clicked, we could drag out an arrow and then have it say okay. that kind of stuff and you can keep making more and more but we don't want all these notations on there so yeah super simple to use just like a text box in Microsoft Word um, or anything of the sorts you guys can write anything in your note just have a note for practice and we're gonna throw it up here at the top of the sheet So the next function that we use a lot is the balloon annotation. So what the balloon annotation does, so when you click it, pretty much all it does is that you point, you hover over any feature on a part, you click it, so that anchors it to wherever you just clicked at. You could drag it to the second point, click there. And it just sets a little balloon there, pointing to that point and saying, OK, this is number one. So balloons are typically used when you're um, doing drawings or parts. Um, they're mainly used for assemblies. Um, and the purpose of balloons are to point out different parts on an assembly, right? If this robot head was constituted of multiple parts, like the handrail, the antenna, the eye, the ear, right? We would start annotating those individual parts as these numbers. Um, and then later on, we could start pretty, um, defining that, OK, number one is the eye. Number two is like the head railing. Number three is the antenna, and so on. But we're going to exit out of that. If you notice, right below the balloon function in the tool tab, though, you see auto balloon, right? So 
auto balloon is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It does what the balloon function does, but it automatically detects different parts and starts pointing at them with different numbers, um, just so you can tell that which part is which. Um, it's a super nifty tool if you have a lot of parts on your uh, assembly that you're trying to draw out. Um, but at the same time, sometimes it might not be the appropriate tool because it doesn't get all the parts that you want. Um, let's say if you mirrored or did linear patterns for certain parts, it wouldn't start pointing to them all. It would only point to the primary ones and then you would have to reference off the other ones as well. Um, so yeah, it's a good combination to use with uh, balloon and auto balloon. Um, you would go in and use balloon to fill in gaps if the program missed it on its auto functions. So, yeah, you see there's a bunch of other stuff like magnetic line, surface finish, weld symbol. Um, we're not going to really talk about that um, because we don't really apply those um, features to our parts. Um, but we're going to talk about hole callout. Hole callout's a super cool tool. Um, it's very important that you use this as much as you can, whenever possible. So pretty much what it does is that it annotates the properties of the hole that you just made. Um, so if I were to do a hole callout on something like this, bottom like hole here, it would define its diameter and its depth, and it would give you that value. So we're going to give that a try. So click on hole callout, hover over this inner circle here on that neck, click it, and drag it out here somewhere where you can read it, and then place it there. So you see the, in, uh, the notation that it makes? This symbol right here, the circle with the slash through it, um, that indicates diameter. So you have a diameter of 2.25. This line here, this notation with the, this little symbol, um, the flat line with an arrow down, it means depth. So from the hole callout, we could tell that this hole is 2.25 inches in diameter with a 0.2 inch depth. Um, this is super easy because you'll be able to combine um, multiple information in a single callout, right? Instead of trying to define the diameter, doing a cross-sectional view of that hole, and then saying, OK, it's 2.25 inches deep. So let's do that. If you made holes in through the uh, hole wizard when you were making your part, so we noticed from before we could make a bunch of different features in our hole, uh, hole wizard, right? Such as threading, countersink parameters, counterbore parameters, um, all that kind of stuff. The hole callout could automatically detect that for you as well. So. With the whole callout still selected, go to the right side of the robot. So whole callout. And these holes on the ear here, um, I made them through the hole wizard when we were making the part. Um, they're partially threaded, I believe. Um, and they have a, oh, they're not threaded. Um, but they have this counter bore on them right now. So we're going to zoom in. We're going to click on that inner circle. So you see it automatically overloads with information, right? So yeah, that little inner circle, click on one of them. It could be any of the holes that we have there on the ear. So we're just going to drag that off, off the page because there's nowhere else to really put it right now. And then we're going to click place. So. It shows you all these information. There's a lot of information in this single annotation. So first number, 8x, 8 times, right? It shows you that there's 8 instances of these holes on this side. Um, so automatically, the circular pattern that we did when we made this part, it shows you, OK, you did that 8 times. So we know that's 8 holes there. Um, they're 0.13 in diameter, inches, 0.13 inches in diameter. And it's a quarter inch deep. However, this little symbol here, this little bracket, um, that means counter bore. Um, so it's like a sunken, like a little well, right? Um, so we have a counter bore of 0.25 inches in diameter and 0.08 inches in depth. The last parameter here is this little V. That symbol V means a counter sink. So it has a diameter of 0 0.03 inches. It's at a 90 degree angle. And it's on the near side, which means it's on the outside. Um, you could also have an option of applying a countersink on the bottom of the hole as well. And then that part, it would have another V, another parameter, and say far side. So essentially, if I wanted to draw a cross-sectional view of this screw with those information, it would look a lot like this.
So this top portion is your countersink feature, the depth of your countersink, and the diameter, your counterbore depth right here, or your counterbore diameter, and then your primary hole depth, which is actually the whole thing, and its diameter right there. So yeah, um, it's an easy way to um, set a lot of information. If you were to tap that hole and put threads in it, it would also read out that information for you and say like a quarter 20, quarter 24, 832, 836. Um, all that kind of information would be there. So yeah, there's that. And this last one, super simple, um, datum target, right? We earlier talked about datum and it's for us to kind of indicate which part is the datum. Um, someone who knows how to read engineering drawings should be able to infer that in a case like this side here, that our left side is our data because all our uh, dimensions are referenced off from there. But in case you want to insert it as a formality, you can go click on data feature uh, target and the toolbar. And then just simply you would click on, actually no, it's not data target. Oops, my bad. It's data feature. There we go. So with the data feature tool selected, you would just hover over whatever you want to consider as your datum, click on it, and then you can just place that item there. And then we have our datum for this to be the bottom. And then we're gonna click escape to exit that mode. So now someone who would read this drawing would automatically be able to infer, okay, this side is datum A, that's our reference, and this bottom is our datum B. This is our bottom where we reference all our dimensions from. So yeah. Um, that's pretty much all the features in a engineering drawing file. So I'm going to be going over this part. So obviously you would save your file if you don't want to lose your progress, right? So it's always recommended you save a file in the drawing as a drawing. So we're just going to go ahead and do that for now. Save it on a folder in the desktop. And But at the same time, it's not the best file to give to other people. What if some people don't have SOLIDWORKS at home, right? Um, but they still want to look at what you're drawing. Um, that's when you go to save as, and as save as type, the option PDF should be there. Right? Pretty much any modern computer could open a PDF file. Um, and a great thing about a PDF file is that it doesn't lose any formatting. What you see here is what you'll be ending up getting, at least within the constraints of this page. So this whole call out information will be lost, but, we go to where we just saved that. Cool. So this is kind of the document you would end up with, right? It's easy to send to other people. It's super easy to print, and it's super easy to read because it maintains all that detail on there. So. This is the kind of stuff you would be printing out if you were to machine um, a certain part and whatnot. And yeah, um, actually one more thing I missed earlier. So if you zoom in on the bottom of the page, you'll see all this mumbo jumbo, right? Um, so yeah, in a formal business setting, you would fill out all these things. Uh, it's drawn <coughs> by who, on what date, checked by who, and checked, by, um, checked on what, what date. Um, and so on. The engineering department checked over it, manufacturing department checked over it, quality assurance, comments. So if you were to work as a mechanic or a technician, um, this is something you might be very familiar with. Um, and yeah, but you can also see um, it down here, it indicates paper size, um, what the file name is, which revision is it, and also what scale. It's hard to see right now. Let me see if I can zoom in. There we go. So it shows you scale revision, drawing number, um, or name, size, weight, and sheet one of one. So if we had multiple sheets in the same file, um, we would be able to define that it'll come out of sheet one of two, um, two of two, and so on. Um, weight would fill in automatically if you gave your part a materials property earlier when we were making the part. So right now it's using some generic material, which doesn't have a proper um, weight kind of um, quality to it. But if we were to uh, define this part as made of completely 6061 aluminum, it would take that into consideration, consider how big it is, and then fill in that weight for you. 
So what if we wanted to change the information here by ourselves, right? This is when you would go to the property managers on the left, right click on the sheet one, right there. And then you would go to edit sheet format. So you can tell everything else disappeared and this portion turned blue, right? Your drawing information is also there, just made it invisible so not to make it distracting. So if you wanted to rename all this stuff, you'd be able to. You could double click it, name it as, let's say I couldn't write properly and this is what I thought it would be called, Robot Hot. I could enter other various information here, like certain comments I would want. Yeah, so things like that. When I submit it to someone, hey, I want 9,000 of these parts made. I can write these kind of comments on there. Um, if you want to make sure, like, if this was something very, um, like, an intellectual property to you, right, um, you'd be able to write your name on it as well so people know that this belongs to you and it shouldn't be in anyone else's hands. Um, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, just all these parts here. Um, these are, you guys can kind of ignore these parts for now. Um, these are, like, for formalities for people who are kind of in a corporation setting. Uh, but I'll be kind of briefly talking over them. Um, so yeah, if you read in here, dimensions are in inches. There's a tolerance, fractional, angular. I don't know what some of these are, but. So tolerances, I'll be kind of talking about that because that's kind of important. So when you're making your part, right? Nothing in this world is 100% precise. If I wanted something made physically four inches wide, there's no way that I could get it to be perfectly four inches. Whether it's a micron, like an atom's worth, um, it will always be off by a certain amount, right? However, you need to define what your tolerances are. So let's say that I'm trying to make this robot head four inches wide, but I could get away with plus or minus like 0 0.05 inches, right? So that would be your tolerance that you would kind of put in there. Okay, I could take anything in a plus or minus um, 0 0.05 inches. You would enter that um, value in there. So people know, okay, I have a little bit of slack in terms of what I could take, right? Technically 3.95 inches will pass as well, or 4.05 inches will pass as well. Um, sometimes you could have tolerances that are okay with undersizing it, but not oversizing it. You would define that as well, um, and whatnot. So yeah, for the time being, and while you guys are working on um, drawings and working on our machining project for next quarter, um, it's nothing too much to worry about. Um, but as you guys kind of learn more about how things fit together, especially in like assembly settings, when you're working with certain parts, you guys will learn that tolerances become very important. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. And once you set whatever comments you want, you can hover over this top right. This button comes into formation. You can click on that, and it returns that view to you with all the new notations you made in text. So yeah, um, with that, that's everything for engineering drawings. Um, anyone have any questions?